Good morning, Future Design. How can I help you? Oh, good morning. My name's Tom McKenzie from McKenzie Advertising. Could I speak to your Managing Director, Mr. Simon Ford, I believe? You'd like to speak to Mr. Ford? Yes, that's right. I see. Sorry, can I just take your name and your company again, please? Of course. My name's Tom McKenzie. Sorry, is that M-C-K-I-N-S-E-Y? No, uh, McKenzie... M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. Okay, I've got that. And sorry, the company? The company is McKenzie Advertising. Okay, thank you. Um, it seems from Mr. Ford's diary that he's spending quite a bit of time out of the office at the moment. I see. And so he's not in today then? Mm, that's right, he's not. So uh, when would I be able to speak to him, do you think? Well, he'll be in the office three days next week, on Monday the 5th. Tuesday the 6th and Friday the 9th. Can I ask you when you prefer to call? And then I can let him know. Um, the 5th will be fine, uh, in the morning. Mm, actually, that will be his first day back in the office. Could you make it the afternoon or possibly on the 6th? Yes, uh, okay, the 6th should be fine, um, about 11 o'clock. Actually, he has a short meeting at 11, but he'll be finished by 11.30. Well, uh, let's make it 11.45 then, just to be on the safe side. OK. And I really need to know what this is in connection with. Mr Ford is, of course, a busy man. Oh, yes, of course. It's regarding an exhibition that we're involved in, and we'd like to talk to Mr Ford because we think it might be of interest to future designs to have some space at the exhibition. Mm, I see. And what kind of exhibition is it, please? It's a sofa exhibition. There are furniture designers coming from many European countries, and we think that your company, Future Designs, would benefit from being there. Mm, I see. Well, actually, I do quite a lot of the exhibition organising for the company. So could you possibly give me some more details? And then I can discuss them with Mr Ford before you call. Oh, I see. You look after the exhibitions? Well, not all of them, but quite a few, yes. Right, well, um, where would you like to start? OK, well, first of all, could you tell me how many visitors you're expecting? Uh, about 500. It's a two-day event, and we're pretty confident we can reach 250 on each day. I see. And regarding cost? Well, we have three different size stands. The smallest one is 10 square metres, then the next one is 20 square metres, and the largest is 30 square metres. OK. Now, in terms of cost, the smallest stand is uh, $120 a day, the medium size stand is $190 a day, and the largest one is $280 a day. Right, and presumably there'll be some refreshments available. Ah, oh, yes. There's a cafe on the first floor and uh, a French restaurant on the second floor. OK, well, I think this could be well of interest to Mr Ford, so I'll meet with him before you call next week. Could I ask you to email the full details to me? Yes, of course. I'll send them through to you. There will be uh, four files in total, so uh, could I take your email address? Well, good morning, everyone. I think you all know me from the interviews you all had. So, welcome again to JRC Swindon. This morning, I'll be showing you around the site. If you have any questions at any point, please don't be shy. As you know, the site was set up here only a year ago, so I think you'll be suitably impressed with the layout of the plant and the new, very cool, office plan. Before we go outside, I just want to run through a few slides with you. I think this will help you to make sense of things when we take the tour. So let me start with the plant itself. From this first slide you can see the layout and it may be quite different to other layouts you're familiar with. First of all, because our engineers were able to rotate the input belt, we were able to store the sand, cement and gravel next to each other. So this is the first space saving measure we were able to take. The flowchart starts here in the top right hand corner and here we are facing the plant. So you can see the loader maintaining the levels of sand, cement and gravel in the input tanks top right. 
and from there the rotating input belt feeding the concrete mixer. Next to this is the silo, and again, due to the brilliance of our engineers, we've been able to increase the silo's capacity and avoid the need for a second silo. In front of the mixer and the silo, you can see the concrete production unit, and on the left of this, the storage area for the molds. In front of the production unit is, as expected, the unloading assembly. Again, you will notice how efficiently we've been able to use the space. The unloading assembly fits perfectly in front of the storage area for the molds. On the right of the production unit, you can see the storage area for the raw materials. Again, this fits very comfortably in front of the input tanks and minimizes the distance the loader needs to travel. Okay, I'll take any questions you may have now. Okay, let's turn our attention to our new, very cool offices. From the slide I think you can see the layout quite clearly, but what I'd like to do is to explain to you why the change, what brought about the new plan, what the thinking is behind this new layout. Well, times are changing. The days when our office space consisted of a small open plan area, a few small closed offices and a handful of large closed offices have indeed gone. Basically. We need new office space for a new era. There are several driving forces behind these changes. As you know, most of us now work in teams, and the teams change quite frequently, depending on the projects we receive. As you also know, last year it was necessary and appropriate to reduce the number of middle management positions in this company. These two factors alone mean that, firstly, we need more open plan space, and for this space to be flexible, and secondly, we no longer have a requirement for the small individual offices that we used previously. So again, from the slide, you can see that we were using quite high but movable walls and a flooring system which allows us to design almost any space we desire. The small cubic floor tiles each hide access to all our communication needs, so it really is an extremely flexible system. There are other driving forces behind these changes, however, and these are less to do with pragmatism and more to do with the kind of environment we want to create, again, for what we see as a new era. The spacious open-plan design with lots of light, the stylish office furniture, the relaxation area with sofas and drinks dispenser, not only suit the kind of working environment we want to create, but also plays an important role in reinforcing the company's branding. Of course our customers are essential to the success of the business. Many of the larger ones request a visit to the site before agreeing sizable contracts with us. So we need a site design which supports the message we're trying to communicate to our customers. This has led to the development of some completely new areas which need explaining. I mentioned briefly the relaxation area, which is designed not just for relaxation, we hope, but also as a space which can be used for relaxed work related chat or brainstorming, that kind of thing. The other new space is between the main departments. You can see that there is quite a wide corridor space with comfortable seating provided. This is what we're going to refer to as collision areas, not in the sense of people bumping into each other, but an area where staff from adjacent departments can come together for short and formal discussions. The benefits are that you can easily see whether the person next door to you is available or not, there is no need to reserve a meeting room, you don't need to be concerned about disturbing the people around you, and you can get together there and then, and decide if whatever you have in mind is worth taking to the next level or not. Again, this is part of an attempt to try to foster more creativity throughout the company. Okay, question time again. Please fire away. Um, okay, so you've both been uh, researching leadership skills in large and small organizations. Um, Rachel, let's start with you. What are some of your, your main findings? Well, I've been looking into two main areas. 
The first is whether leaders are born leaders or mm -hmm. whether anyone, any of us, can learn to become a leader. Mm -hmm. And the second area is the main leadership skills. I mean, what skills are required mainly? Mm -hmm. Actually, I thought these would be two fairly straightforward questions to answer, mm -hmm. but they, they turned out not to be. Mm -hmm. On the question of whether or not leaders are born, it seems that we are unlikely to become leaders if we do not acquire certain characteristics quite early on in life. Mm. But there seems to be very little evidence to back up the notion that leaders have to be born leaders. Mm. The qualities I mentioned, by the way, are fairly common qualities. Nothing very special or unusual. And then on the question of leadership skills... Sorry, Rachel. Uh, so, sorry, let me stop you there. Uh, so when you say fairly common qualities, could you give us some examples? Yeah, sure. It seems that to become a leader, a person needs to be, for example, very comfortable with themselves and they need to develop a fairly high level of self-confidence. They also need to be quite intelligent in the sense of being able to understand quite complicated situations fairly quickly. In terms of skills, they need to be able to develop a rapport mm. with others, again, quite quickly. Mm. So you're saying they need to, to get on with many different kinds of people quite easily. Yeah, th yeah, that's right. But it's not just a question of getting on with people and having confidence in yourself. If I can talk more about some of the skills... Yes, please do. Yeah. Actually, this was quite surprising for me because I thought the necessary skills for good leadership would be, for example, able to make decisions quickly, be a very strong, assertive person. Those mm. qualities do play a part, but as I say, something I felt to be quite surprising is the number one skill of effective leadership, and most of the literature seems to agree that good listening skills are an absolute prerequisite. Mm, that's good, Rachel. Thanks for that. Um, John, did any of uh, Rachel's findings tie in with yours? Mm, very much so. Particularly what Rachel was saying about relationships with other people and being a good listener. Mm -hmm. From what I read, it seems that there is quite a few different leadership styles. Oh, that's right, of course. Mm. Right. Well, at first I thought this was referring to different leaders leading in different ways because they, I mean, leaders have different personalities from each other. Mm -hmm. Now... That might indeed be true, but that's not really the main point. Oh, well, please go on. Well, it seems the point is that leaders will have people in his or her team who are all very different people with their own different personalities, mm -hmm. their own different strengths and different weaknesses, different skills and different attitudes. Mm -hmm. In order to be an effective leader, you need to be able to motivate all the people in your team, of course. Hmm. So you need to be able to apply the right leadership style with each person in your team. Mm -hmm. So whether a leader is successful or not will depend on his ability to use a range of motivational techniques to inspire people to have an even wider range of personalities. This was a real revelation for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, could you give us an example of what you mean? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I think a good example is the amount of freedom a team member or employee has. I mean the level of autonomy they have with which to do their tasks. Mm -hmm. If someone has a lot of experience in a job then perhaps what they need from a leader is to be let's say on the same level. Mm -hmm. So they're able to talk about their tasks with the leader and discuss the best way forward. Mm -hmm. In this kind of situation an effective leader will probably stipulate what the end goal is but how best to achieve the goal will be left to the discretion of the experienced employee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This kind of leadership style is probably not going to be effective, however, with someone who, say, is eager but who has little experience. Mm -hmm. Probably, with this employee profile, the leader has to stipulate not only what needs to be done, but also how best to do it. Mm -hmm. The leader then probably needs to meet more often with the second employee than with the experienced employee mm -hmm. to check on progress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can see different leadership styles emerging depending on the team member's profile. That's excellent, John. And I'd like you to develop that idea.
Good morning and welcome to the second lecture on business ethics. Today I will start by looking at what has become known as corporate responsibility and we will look at the definition for this. I will then move on to look at the importance of being an ethical company in today's business world. And finally, we will consider one of the most sensitive issues within the zone of ethics, that of child labour. First then, what do we mean when we talk about corporate responsibility, and why has this not been an issue until quite recently? Well, clearly, corporate responsibility is not unlike our own personal responsibility. We are responsible for our actions. We must consider the implications of those actions, both for ourselves and for others. It is universally accepted that, while we all need to look after our own interests and strive for our own personal growth and development, we must do so with due respect and consideration for other people and for the environment in which we operate. And the same can be said for commercial organisations. So corporate responsibility is about how well an organisation contributes to society. And we can measure that by assessing the level of positive impact on society that an organisation creates. So, moving on to the next point, why is corporate responsibility suddenly an issue? Well, actually, if you look at the energy industry, for example, there is nothing new at all about society's demands for this kind of responsibility from companies. For many, many years, oil, gas and electricity companies have had to adopt a green approach to their business. And I say had to because the measures they have been forced to take have usually had a negative impact on their bottom line. What's new about this issue is that we are now seeing social demands being placed on a much wider range of businesses, if not all businesses. This is a shift in thinking, of course, which we all welcome. So, are we likely to find the same shift in thinking in the financial departments of the most aggressive multinationals? Is making a profit no longer the raisin debt? Well, yes and no, in that order. Yes, we are likely to find a new, more socially responsible way of thinking in large corporations, and no, of course, this does not mean that profits are taking a back seat. This new thinking is still all about profits. The need for companies to be more socially responsible has reached such a level that, if they are not seen to be, they are unlikely to be able to maintain their market position or to maintain healthy profits. You will have noticed I said seem to be socially responsible. Does this mean that it's enough to create an image of an ethical company even if there is nothing really ethical going on behind the scenes? Well, again no. Customers are more savvy these days and any organisation which is simply pretending will soon be exposed and the consequences of that can be more damaging than making no attempt to be socially responsible at all. I'll now move on to the sensitive issue of child labour. The question many people ask is, are children still being exploited by large corporations? This is not an easy question to answer because it depends very much on the employment conditions, if I can use that term and also on where we draw the line between employment and exploitation. Let me explain this point more clearly. There are indeed children, some of them as young as 10, working in factories which produce products for large multinationals, food companies, sportswear companies. Yes, this is still happening today. But what most of these companies now do is to have these children work on a part-time basis doing simple jobs, but then they also send the children to school and pay for this education. So, we have to remember two facts at this point. One, the children earn money for their family who are living not only in poverty, but in extreme poverty. And two, 
If the children stand any chance of getting beyond their current way of life, they need an education. The multinationals involved are providing both of these. Some people still argue, and perhaps they have a case, that this corporate behaviour is still ex exploitation. However, we also need to bear in mind that the responsibility for these terrible conditions does not lie primarily with the multinationals, but with the local governments and the governments of developed countries. But this is taking us into another area, and one which is outside the scope of this lecture. I've included some reference in the handout for further reading. One final point is that, right or wrong, the laws of supply and demand will always play their part. People in developed countries expect to pay lower and lower prices in the high street, while at the same time demanding higher and higher salaries. So, for many companies in developed countries, it is becoming more and more difficult to stay competitive. If these companies fail to do so, there are serious consequences for employment in developed countries. The directors of multinationals, therefore, often face a dilemma. Should their company's ethical behaviour begin at home or abroad? We'll take a short break here. Just 15 minutes, please.